Welcome to NucleCast, the official podcast of the NY Deterrence Center. Our host is Dr. Adam Lauther, co-founder and vice president for research at the National Institute for Deterrence Studies. The ANWA Deterrence Center is a 501c3 organization ensuring a broader understanding of the nation's strategic nuclear deterrent and its ongoing modernization. Thank you for listening and welcome to the show. The views of the host and the guests are their own. Welcome back to another great episode of NuclearCast. In keeping with our tradition every episode, we have a great guest, and I'll say a personal friend. Of course, I'm talking about Dr. Amit Gupta, who is the senior advisor to the former federations in Ottawa, Canada. But he and I got to know each other teaching at the Air War College at Maxwell Air Force Base. And he's also a senior fellow at the National Institute for Deterrence Studies. And Amit, we're going to talk about the Indian and Pakistani nuclear weapons program. And of course, Amit has written a book on the Indian nuclear program. So look that up, Amit Gupta, get a copy, and uh, you can learn even more than we'll talk about today. So Amit, welcome to NucleCast. Well, thank you for having me, Adam. And it's really good to see you after so many years. So It is. It is. And uh, so you have an expertise in the Indian nuclear weapons program, but also Pakistan and then India's relations to China and the rest of the world. And these are all topics Americans probably have misperceptions about, but you know them well. So could you start us off with a discussion of the India and Pakistan nuclear programs? Sort of what do they have? What drove them there? What's the history behind okay. their programs? Uh, let me start with what drove them there. And in the Indian case, it was two things. It was autonomy and ability. And autonomy was the Indians, since they got independent in 1947, said we have to have an autonomous foreign policy. And part of being an autonomous foreign policy or requiring an autonomous foreign policy is having an autonomous defense capability. And really from about the late 50s, early 60s, the Indians start talking about perhaps we should test for a nuclear weapon. They eventually go for it in 1974. And it it takes time because the man who should have done it died in a plane crash. So it sort of set the program back. Plus India had internal issues. The ability part is a really good one because... Indian scientists say we are world-class scientists. And if you're a nuclear scientist, one of the things which shows your ability to compete with the rest and the best is to be able to build and test nuclear weapons. And I interviewed the guy who did India's first nuclear test. So in the background, I asked him, I said, how did you get into the business? And he said, when I graduated from the University of London, I got two postgraduate scholarships. One was to study nuclear physics. The other was to study the classical piano. He was that good. (laughs) He was that good. And your viewers know that between music and physics, the connection is huge, right? So he wrote to his father like any good Indian boy. And his father said, how many dark skin concert pianists do you see in 1948? Be smart. (laughs) and go into nuclear physics. So he went and built a bomb. So this is the caliber of these people. These are not people who are spending their time scouring the internet for spare parts. These are people who actually do see themselves as capable scientists. So the Indians test in 74, the Pakistanis lose the war to India in 1971. And they say, okay, we need a nuclear weapon because that's the only way to deter the Indians because the Indians have a conventional advantage over us. And the Pakistanis go around the world getting the technology through legal and through illegal means. And they get help by the Chinese, because the Chinese do the one thing for them, which is really useful. They give them the bomb design of their second nuclear bomb test. And the only reason we know this is David Sanger has published this, that when the Libyans handed over whatever they'd been given by the Pakistani nuclear scientist A.Q. Khan, the American uh, 
nuclear experts looked at it and said, wait a second, that's the second nuclear bomb that was produced by the Chinese. So the trail was there. And that technology has then moved on to North Korea. So this this sort of goes in a very interesting direction. Now, what are their capabilities? Both sides. Well, let me ask you before that, Mm -hmm. for the Indians, because the Indians had conventional Mm. superiority vis-a-vis the Pakistanis, who at that time, that was that was where the major tensions were. Right. So what was the rationale for India when they were already superior to go nuclear? But <clears throat> partly it was China, partly it was domestic politics. The prime minister was facing a difficult internal situation. So she said, let's blow up a bomb. And we then become one of six countries in the world that has a nuclear capability. And the whole country loved her for about three months. And then all the problems came back. Unless you're North Korea, you can't pull that one for too long. (laughs) So that's why the Indians did it. They were worried in the long term about China. And there was the domestic element of it. Now, what happens is the Pakistanis get the bomb by about 1987, by all open source accounts. And in 1998, a government comes into power in India, which says, we need to have a second round of nuclear tests. And their stated agenda was India must be a global nuclear power because that makes you one of six or one of eight or whatever. The second reason was the scientists were telling them, if you want a range of nuclear weapons from sub kiloton all the way up to thermonuclear, then we have to test. The one test we did in uh, 1974 wasn't enough. And we've seen this with the North Koreans. The North Korean first test was, what, half a kiloton, and everybody was laughing at them. Well, now they've got a 100 kiloton bomb. So they obviously know what to do. It was the same thing with the Indians. They claimed the test was about anywhere between 15 to 30 kilotons. It actually was probably two kilotons. But what they did in 98 worked to their advantage. So they did five tests. The thermonuclear one didn't work. The Pakistanis responded with six tests. And then both sides started building weapons. Today, where they stand is at about 150 or so on both sides. And look, you have to look at doctrine and see where it is. The Indian doctrine is no first use, though there are some questions about is this really the case? But the logic is we have conventional superiority We can deter a Pakistani conventional attack. We can go in and punish the Pakistanis without crossing their nuclear red lines. And why do we need to use the nuclear weapon? Against China, neither the Indians nor the Chinese have shown any interest on doing anything along the border which would lead to a nuclear escalation. And China is also no first use nation, by the way. I'll get to China in a minute. So the Pakistani one is slightly different. Pakistanis talk about full spectrum deterrence and they say we could do deterrence or we may have to use nuclear weapons if there's an economic stranglehold, if Indian troops threaten our vital interests and they go down the list on this. And the reason for being so ambiguous is it raises uncertainty on the Indian side and leads to greater caution. Now, The second part of doctrine is the Indians say, what are the three things that worry us? One, there must be civilian control of nuclear weapons. They believe in the civil military relationship, and that shapes the way they build their forces. Secondly, we will not keep our weapons mated. What they mean by that is, The fissile material will be in one place. The warhead will be in one place. The delivery system will be in one place. That's a good security measure because you may be able to steal one, but getting all three is difficult. And just getting uh, the warhead isn't going to help you. So that part is there. And the third thing the Indians are horribly worried about is an accidental launch. So they say if you have it demated, it makes a lot of sense because then launch is going to only happen if 
it's been authorized by the politicians. On the Pakistani side, they also say our weapons are demated, but we can assemble them a lot more quickly. And you just need three generals to take the decision. Now, in Pakistan, the Prime Minister of Pakistan, the President of Pakistan do not control the nuclear arsenal. It's controlled by the military. And that's oh. always been the deal since the return of democracy. You don't get to tell us how this thing is going to be maintained. Really? And, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a... Um, I don't I mean, think I knew that. I assume the prime minister had control. No, this is the military controls it. And it's done because the Pakistani military doesn't trust the politicians, Consis- considers them corrupt and venal. And there is some uh, justification to that charge. Let me put it that way. So you have two different doctrines. The Pakistanis have also built tactical nuclear weapons. Because what the Indians did was, they said in the early 2000s, that what we need to do is to be able to move rapidly into Pakistan. So they were trying to reconfigure their uh, forces to do that. So the Pakistanis went and built tactical nukes and said, push comes to shove, we'll stop the Indians with a blast. And the Indian response is, if you do that, then we hit you with everything we have. And there's a lot of really bad academic literature out there on how the Indians are going for a first strike capability and they're piecing together comments meant by people as well as what they think are technological uh, breakthroughs on the Indian side. I don't agree with that. Uh, Adam, you know the American uh, nuclear history far better than I do. So think of how many times in the United States People have spoken about, we need to have a first strike capability. We need to have a war fighting doctrine with nuclear weapons. And all this goes on. And at the end of the day, every president who comes in says, well, it's mutual assured destruction. Sure. Right. Right. Because when you start putting together the numbers on what the Pentagon would want, we'd be bankrupt as a nation. So on the Indian side, they see it the same way. The other thing that worried the Indians about tactical nuclear weapons was this meant giving control of the weapons to the military, which rocks the civil military balance. And they didn't want that. The other thing was ageist. Giving nuclear weapons to the military, tactical nukes meant you were giving them to captains and majors. And every Indian politician said, oh, my God, we're going to have 30-year-olds launch nuclear warheads? I don't think so. And so that is why they took that particular decision. And I'll say one last thing. Again, the all the comments that are made about what these people are doing misses several things. One, every time the Indians and the Pakistanis have gotten into it, and they've gotten into it on two separate occasions, sure. they don't reach automatically for their nuclear weapons. Right. 2019, there was a terrorist attack in India, which the Indians blamed on Pakistan. They went across the border. They went about 60 miles across the border, dropped some bombs, came back. Next day, the Pakistani Air Force went and dropped bombs across the border and shot down a Indian MiG-21. But neither side reached for its nuclear weapons. And if you talk to the Pakistanis, they really believe there has to be an escalation ladder, just as the Indians do. And they say, first, conventional deterrence, then maybe tactical nukes, then go for the big one. But my own feeling is, given that neither side has the C-cubed eye to do this, we don't know about the accuracy of either side's missiles, this is going to be counter value. And I'm a great believer in what Chairman Mao used to say about this. Chairman Mao used to say, I just need to take six to eight American cities. Yeah. Right. And this... Brookings did a study where they said Biden won far fewer counties than Donald Trump in the 2020 election. But Biden's counties had 5 million more people than Trump's counties. Mm -hmm. Biden's counties accounted for 70% of American GDP. So we're we're talking San Francisco, LA, Boston, New York. So if you were trying to target the US today, would you target Montgomery, Alabama, which would I mean, must <laughs> cause me some pain? 
Or would you try to target Boston or New York sure. and pick out Wall Street? Sure. So it, it's the same logic. Three major cities in Pakistan, two or three major cities in India. You've set both countries back, and they know that in terms of doctrine. Now, th- there's a difference also in culture and nuclear weapons, which is sometimes people allow the rhetoric to become such that it scares everybody around the world. So the Pakistani prime minister came to the United States. This was Imran Khan, the cricketer, and said, well, the Indians won't settle Kashmir. And if they don't do that, it'll lead to nuclear war. So everybody started saying, what is he talking about? Not realizing that this is the kind of exaggerated rhetoric you engage in, which drives diplomats and generals crazy. So essentially, that's it. It's not going to go over 150, maybe 200 warheads tops. Uh, It'll be counter value, despite whatever the academic literature may be talking about. That is the India-Pakistan thing. Now, the last point on this is, Paul Nitsi wrote this back in the 50s. He said the problem with building nuclear weapons is they give you the deterrence at the nuclear level that you can carry out conflict at the conventional level and the subconventional level. And the Pakistanis have done this repeatedly with the Indians until 2019, when the Indians crossed the border and says, look, the, their prime minister said, we also have nuclear weapons. They're not firecrackers. They're, me- they're meant to have a particular use. So the message was, if you come across the border, we come across the border. Okay. So right. that, okay. that's, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say it's that time in the show where we have to take a quick break. So we'll we'll do that. And when we come back, if we could shift to to the Indian perspective on China, because this is probably one of the areas where most Americans don't really understand it particularly well. So we'll shift to that. You're listening to Nuclecast and we'll be right back. This episode of Nuclecast is brought to you by the Anwar Deterrent Center whose mission is to educate Americans about the nuclear enterprise and strategic deterrence. And we're back and we're talking to Dr. Amit Gupta, an expert in India's nuclear and really the region's nuclear challenges. And we were talking about uh, the Indian and Pakistani uh, programs and sort of the history, but now I want to shift to China because I, I'll never forget the last time I was, or actually I think it was the first time I was in, in India. And I, I thought I'd hear a lot of discussion about Pakistan and nobody ever spoke about Pakistan. They only spoke about China, which for me, you know, it, it dispelled a misconception I had about what the Indians care most about and what they see as the biggest threat. So, Amit, let me turn it back over to you and tell us about how the Indians see China and the role that that it plays in the region. And then how does India want to address this? Okay. I'll just add one thing to the Pakistan uh, sure. question. I have a good friend who's a retired Indian Army general, and he said, look, At the end of the day, the Indians and the Pakistanis are the same DNA. So we think the same way. It's like East Germans, West Germans. And because we think the same way, we we believe in the survival of the nation. So we're not going to go in for crazy uh, adventures without really thinking through the consequences. Now, to come to China, which is the problem for the Indians is they had a disputed border with the Chinese. And the Chinese in 1962, well, actually in 1960, 61, the Indians start sending their troops up to the border to say, well, we claim this land, so we're going to put our soldiers there. The soldiers would go there, they would make Chinese resistance, the Chinese would pull back. The Indians learned the wrong lesson from that. They thought they were deterring the Chinese. That isn't what it was, was happening. The Chinese way of thinking is, look, we've come and told you this property belongs to us. Do not encroach upon it. 62, there's a war. The Indian army gets uh, humiliated. And, and the Chinese in the northwest take the territory they wanted. In the east, they come all the way down into India. 
And then they pull back saying, well, we always said you can keep the east, but give us the north uh, uh, west. What's happened since is the Indians have got nuclear weapons. They've been engaged in what Ashley Tellus calls creeping weaponization. It, it's, it's not a rapid buildup of nuclear forces in the way the U.S. and the Soviet Union did in the 50s and 60s. This is going very slowly. In contrast, the Chinese have done two things. They built up their conventional capabilities to the extent now that they have uh, GPS-guided rockets, artillery, missiles, and drone-guided stuff. So along the border, their plan is we don't want to take territory because they've taken all the territory they wanted. That's happened in the last 10 years or so. They say, we, if there is a war, we will inflict maximum damage on personnel and infrastructure. And the Indians are now slowly starting to develop a counterability. They're building roads in the region. They're buying the type of weaponry they need. The Indian Army has just launched a major program over the last couple of years to buy commercial drones because they recognize how useful those are for reconnaissance and possibly even for doing the kinds of things the Ukrainians have done. So that's the situation there. Neither side is talking about nuclear warfare in the Himalayas. Both see this as a conventional skirmish or a conventional war. And the Chinese feel confident enough that they can inflict the damage on the Indians. They also know very clearly to go down and take some of the territory they claim, especially in the east, the Indians are too well entrenched. So you would require a lot of forces and be a long war. It's a lot easier to bomb a few air bases. Yeah. So that, that is the strategy there. Now, what the Indians are doing is they're trying to build this up. They're trying to look for partners. But the problem with looking for partners is you look for them in an Indian way of uh, yeah. doing things. And since you've been to India, you know exactly what I'm talking about, which is, yes, we want you to be our partner, but hey, these are the 1,216 strings that you can't attach to anything. And the other side looks at it and says, okay, then what can we attach? And, and it yeah. becomes like that. Uh, it's very difficult to transfer technologies to India. The Pentagon has all kinds of questions about that. Uh, the Indians don't have the money. They have the money to buy some things. They don't have the money to buy everything. And the third thing is that the Indians have this really strong link with the Russians. Right. The Russians essentially built up the Indian space program. The Indians are going to the Russians now to get cryo engines for the subsequent uh, rockets that they want to build. And they won't get those from the United States. Right. The Russians are helping them build a supersonic missile and they've transferred the technology, complete tech transfer, which the Indians haven't been able to replicate. There's also talk about the second missile, which is called the Brahmos, will be the Brahmos 2, will be hypersonic. So the Indians then join China, the US and Russia as having a hypersonic capability. So the Russian link is solid. There is even talk about leasing a second uh, nuclear submarine to the Indians from Russia. And remember that when AUKUS was done, it was also made clear to New Delhi that it would not get an AUKUS-like deal from Washington. So there's some dependence on the Russians. There's some frustration with the Russians because tr good luck getting spare parts from the Russians. There are quality control issues, so on. But the Indians essentially say at the end of the day, we're going to have to stand up alone against the Chinese. Now, their nuclear triad, the submarine wing of this triad or the submarine arm of this triad is very much in a developmental stage. And as it stands, it couldn't really go through the Strait of Malacca into a position where it could target Chinese cities or Chinese military bases and so on. That's going to take a few years to come down the line. But they have built a MIRV missile. They've had one test of it. Presumably, they'll have to do more tests before they can validate its uh, effectiveness. 
So that is the Chinese side in this. Flip side, Adam, is you have the same problem that the United States has uh, with China. And that is this huge market dependency. Right. Right. On Uh, China specifically. On China specifically. When I travel on Metro in New Delhi, I always sit next to the young kids, mainly because they all see my gray hair and stand up and say, sir, please take a seat, including a young (laughs) pregnant woman once stood up. And I was like, oh, my God, I hope nobody I know is in this cabin because (laughs) this is going to be awful if they're in the same carriage. But I always ask them about cell phones and they all buy Vivo, Oppo, Xiaomi cell phones. Yeah. These are the three, 70% of the Indian cell phone market is Chinese. Uh, Paytm was the biggest um, mobile phone payment system in India, which had a Chinese uh, majority ownership of it. And one can go down the list of this, regardless of what the Indians may say. At the end of the day, the economic connections keep growing and there is no way that you can stop them. And I'll give you one simple example. When the army was buying drones, it told all the domestic drone manufacturers who are essentially buying off-the-shelf components, you can't buy from China. So one guy came back and said, 70% of all drone parts are manufactured in China. Where, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> so they, what they do is they get it sent to Poland or some country like that. Say, could you please turn a scru- screwdriver so we can call it assembled in Poland? Yeah. And then it passes the... Uh, the uh, the army's test on what is considered a safe system to purchase. So you have this real problem for the United States, um, uh, sorry, for the Indian uh, politicians. How do you break an economic dependency? How do you act more forcefully on the border? And can you sustain a war? And they've had trouble with that because they, um, when they had their first, confrontation with the Chinese in recent years. They went to the Israelis to get more uh, PGMs. And the Israelis said, sure, not a problem, but we'll charge you 150% since it's an emergency buy. Same thing happened when they had their second uh, confrontation with the Chinese. They went to the French. And the French were equally friendly. They said, of course, anything you want, we'll give you, but 150%. You can't keep going back to that well. And by the way, again, Go ask the Ukrainians and the Russians about how much money they've been giving to people for all the emergency purchases they've been making. So to sum it up, you need a strong internal arms production capability. You need to work out an efficient way to work with partners. And third, you need to build up your capabilities on the border where you actually feel you can effectively deter the Chinese. Okay, well, that puts us at a good point because we've got a few minutes left in the show. So of course I want to bring out Bob the genie. And as I rub my magic lamp now, Amit, Bob grants three wishes to all guests, mm-hmm. but those wishes, you can't wish for fame. You can't wish for eternal youth. Right. You can't wish for money. You got to wish for, for things related to the topics we've been discussing. Okay. So Amit, let me ask you, What is your first wish? My first wish is that India and the United States build an economic partnership which seriously develops India and strengthens the ties between the two countries. And I'll just give you very three good examples. One, the Indians have a Make in India program, which includes tourism. Name one country which is better than the United States at making tourist-friendly venues, good hotels, so on. We call it Disney World, okay? Yeah. I have yeah. never gone to see the fascist mouse. So the second one is education. India is educationally having problems in the sense that it doesn't have a large enough base of people who are well-trained in the English language. And It's falling behind in science, technology, and so on. Again, which country can do that for you? Easily bet United States. And during the Obama administration, they signed an agreement to have 200 community colleges, which went nowhere. But here's the thing. In India, one of the big problems is creating employment. 
Community colleges means you're creating people who are self-employed, plumbers, electricians, carpenters, so on. And one of these guys gets his certificate in 2024. By 2029, he's hiring five or 10 people. He's his own little small business. So I would say, one, tourism, two, education, three, healthcare. Yeah. I mean, just to give you an idea, I had to get a CT scan done. It cost me at that point of time $150 in India. It would have cost me an arm and a leg, even with my insurance in the United States. Build up this capability. The Indians are very good at vaccine manufacturing. Help them build those capabilities so they can be used around the world. So that's wish number one. Okay. And, you know, speaking of tourism, you you know, the U.S. and India can build a medical tourism. Absolutely. Uh, Yeah. Because I've heard of that. You know, I lived, I'm from the, you know, the Texas border area. And before Mm -hmm. it got pretty violent, we would go to the dentist, go to the the drugstore, go to the doctor in Mexico because it was quite a bit less expensive. So buy your insulin in Mexico. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that's wish number one. How about wish number two? The Indians have to talk to the Chinese. Look, in Asia, it is the largest economy. Asia is now two-thirds of global growth. Last year, the IMF said two-thirds of global growth was Asia. The rest was Africa, South America, North America, Europe. So you can't live in this situation where you keep saying, oh, we're going to fight the Chinese, we're going to fight the Chinese. Tone down the rhetoric and say to them very clearly, we have serious issues with you on the border. We are not going to compromise on that. But in the meantime, we'll be like the Koreans and the Japanese and their relationship with the Chinese. What can give you greater joy than making money off your enemy? And (laughs) I I really would like to see more of that happening. And it's something, I mean, Adam, there's a huge chunk of Indians now going to China to study in Chinese universities. So I'm not sure where that's going to go. So that's wish number two. Okay, great. That's a good, that's a good wish. Okay. Wish number three. Wish number three is revamp Indian defense production to make it into three categories. One, where you are making stuff which you require for autonomy. So nuclear warheads, strategic weaponry, you can't go anywhere else. You better be independent at that. Two, if you want to build conventional weapons, seek good partners around the world because nothing you seem to make is acceptable to the Indian Armed Forces in the long run, and there are quality control issues. I mean, I is can. This, help. Is this the fault of DRDO and and just oh, yeah. the bureaucracy and? It's DRDO. It's bureaucracy. It's the military saying we're not going to buy substandard weaponry. I'll I'll give you an example. Uh, the Indians have inked a deal with the Russians to set up a factory to build the AK two hundred three, which is essentially the most recent version of the AK-47. Now, they did a study before the factory ramped up production, and they found out that they could buy three AK-203s in Russia for the cost of producing one in India. And they weren't going to meet production schedules anyway. So the question became, why are you doing this? And, I mean, I bought an AK-47 in Alabama for $300. Yeah. Yeah. So in those days, that was 12,000 rupees. These yeah. ones that they are talking about are going to be well over 100,000 rupees. So wow. why not just go and buy stuff simply and produce stuff within the country which the private sector can produce efficiently? Drones. Um, the Turks and the Iranians have proven this to us, that you can make drones off the shelf and you can make a lot of them. Uh, surveillance systems. The private sector in India is very good at doing that. The private sector in India now has a deal with the Bulgarians to make the Bulgarian AK-47. And you can go down the list on this. So those would be my three wishes. Well, those are, I'll I'll be honest with you, those are good wishes. So thanks for 
providing those. Now, unfortunately, we are out of time. So I want to thank you, Amit Gupta, for joining us on this episode of Nuclecast. Well, thank you for having me, Adam. And again, great to see you again. It's good to see you. And thanks to you, the listeners, and we'll see you on the next episode. I tell you, I always enjoy talking to Amit. He is such a good storyteller. And he's, you know, he's a funny guy. And I always enjoy his perspective because it's always a little different than the way I had thought about it. So it's it's just always a great and enjoyable discussion. And so I enjoyed hearing about, you know, sort of the the history and the flow of the of the Pakistan India conflict and then how the Indians see China. Hopefully you enjoyed it as well. This has been a production of the Anwar Deterrent Center, a 501c3 that seeks to educate key decision makers, stakeholders, and the public to ensure a broader understanding of the nation's strategic nuclear deterrent. Our executive producer is Kimberly Charrington, and this episode has been engineered and mixed by David Crumpel. Help us grow our followers by sharing it and follow the show on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter at Nuclecast.